When you're talking about data mesh, and talking about data mesh is a thing that we in the Kafka community are doing a lot these days, you're probably talking about the work of Jamak Dehani. Or if you're lucky, you're talking to Jamak, which is what I get to do today. Uh, we talk about data mesh, she's the creator of the idea, and she really gives a great introduction to it as a conceptual framework and kind of grounded in enough implementation concepts. Listen to this episode, this is a thing you need to understand, and she gives a great explanation. Also, can't fail to mention, uh, streaming audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer, and that is a website, developer.confluent.io. I just like saying that, so I'm gonna say it again, developer.confluent.io. There are free video courses, a library of event-driven architecture design patterns that's actually pretty substantial right now and something we're, we're always building out more of. You can get a list of episodes of this podcast if you want. So all kinds of great things. Check out Confluent Developer. And if you listen to the end, I will give you a discount code uh, that will get you extra Confluent Cloud usage uh, when you sign up and you, you do courses and do exercises there. So without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Jamak. Hello and welcome to another episode of Streaming Audio. I am your host, Tim Berglund, and I am super happy to be joined in the virtual studio today by Jamak Degani. Uh, Jamak is the person best known for the topic of data mesh, and that's what we're going to talk about. Jamak, welcome to the show. Hi, Sim. Thank you for having me. Um, excited to have you on. And I, I neglected the whole say where you work and what your title is. Now, you happen to work at ThoughtWorks, and I know titles at ThoughtWorks are kind of a thing, but what do you what do you do there? Oh, at the moment, uh, I'm kind of focused on uh, the emerging technologies in North America and really creating a process that allows other people to come up with new and novel ideas like I did with Data Mesh. Oh, nice. Oh, okay. That's very cool. Actually, I didn't know that. That sounds, uh, that sounds like a thing ThoughtWorks would do with a senior person. That's awesome. So um, let's talk about data mesh. Now, um, I'm not just going to ask you what it is, like we'll get there, but I think um, I, I think the best way to attack this, if, if you're new, I mean, everybody listening, if you haven't bumped into it as a buzzword, you have now, but you probably have. Um, I think the best way to understand it is in terms of the story. So like, tell us about analytics, tell us about data. Where have we been uh, that is maybe, you know, the thing that we want to change? Tell us about the bad old days of, of analytics. Sure. Maybe I start a little bit from the beginning. Um, I think, you know, for almost half a century, we've had ambitions around putting data into work to make better decisions, to serve our customers better. But the progression that we see is that we kind of started, you know, with data warehousing, which was supposed to serve business intelligence, making strategic decisions, you know, based on reports that were, you know, being created on a quarterly basis, monthly basis, and so on. And as the time has gone by, we have found ourselves with, much more audacious kind of use cases for data, right? Today, um, we not only want to do all the things we did with, with business intelligence, but we also want to use data for designing our products, for optimizing the services, optimizing the workflow, giving superpowers to our employees. So we really want to embed ML and analytics in every aspect of our business. And not only that, we want to... We want everyone in the organization be able to use data, right? We really want to be data driven. So if we have a product, you know, manager, they need to understand the behavior of their customers and the users based on the data. They need to embed intelligence in their products with personalizations, recommendations, and all aspects. We want every engineer be able to build those solutions. So so the the complexity and our, you know kind of ambitions, ambitious plans for using data has grown. The complexity of those use cases have grown. And on the other hand, I think what we found is that to, 
to truly, you know, build those ML models or analytical um, kind of functions, we do need data that comes from many, many different sources within the organization or outside of the organization. So we tackled the scale of the data over the last few decades from the case of you know, volume. We tackled volume with Hadoop and distributed file systems and those sorts of systems. Mobile came along and then we had a problem with velocity and, and streaming and Confluent and Kafka of the world and you know, streaming technologies came along. And we have a problem now with the, the diversity of the data, the origins of the data, and where those sources are. They can be anywhere on this planet or beyond. So, so how, do we, how do we need to meet those ambition, ambitious goals that we have, given the complexity and dynamic nature of the organizations, and given the proliferation of this ubiquitous data? Like, What solution do we need to build? Right. Something different than we've had. And so just thinking about what you said there. Um, and I, I always like to, when contrasting the way we've been doing things with the revolution, I'm, you know, whatever revolution we're currently talking about at the minute that we're trying to unleash, I, you know, I always want to say it's, it's not that we were doing it wrong. Um, it's that the concerns have changed. The environment has changed because the, the classical ETL data warehouse world, um, you know, you put, put yourself a few decades ago and the, the set of concerns that it, it grew as its own revolution to address, you know, you might picture an oak paneled room and a person in a suit, maybe some gray hair with a phone, you know, giving orders to buy and sell and, and ship. And then somebody hands them a report, you know, and they need to look at this report so they can make decisions about what to buy and sell that day or what, what the business should do that day. And that, well, you know, I'm playing it up a little bit, but, um, that was what data warehouses were for. Were for. There, there was a decision maker and she or he needed to know what was going on yesterday so you could give good orders today. And you said some things that, that I think are key here, which is that that's fine. Like nobody's going to stop wanting that. That wasn't a bad thing to want. It wasn't a bad thing to build tools for. It was a very, very good thing. But data now is getting driven into operations so that people maybe at the bottom of the org chart who are just doing stuff, uh, they need the, 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 the analyzed um, activity of the business put in front of them for decisions that they're making. Um, yeah, that absolutely. Sound, yeah. And, and, you know, it's just that we, you know, if you imagine this picture of data coming from so many different sources and it needs to be used by so many different people and in so many other different contexts and use cases, What's the best way to connect these two? Right. Is the best way to connect it through a lake or a warehouse, an intermediate data team, or is it really the best to connect them in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion? Hence, mesh. Hence, uh, mesh. Right. Mesh implies uh, many peer nodes that are interconnected in in arbitrary ways. It's a graph. We don't. We don't know a priori what those connections are going to be, but we're going to make it so that those connections can form. Exactly. Um, I mean, any any system, and we talk about system in an abstract way. The system could be an organizational structure, could be an architecture or technical system. But I think any system that needs to scale out, and we're at a point in time that we really need to scale out our solutions, need to remove the points of synchronization, the points of coordination. I mean, that's how... If you think about uh, the past technological kind of breakthroughs that we had in terms of scaling, I can go all the way from networking with async IO to reactive programming to, you know, how even the, the parallel databases work. All of these systems have been able to scale out by removing points of contention and synchronization. Okay. Make it so that they don't have to synchronize. They don't uh, have to have this intermediary broker or, or someone who makes a decision for them. Yeah. And yet, organizationally, we have had designed ourselves so we will have this data team, BI team, someone in the middle that would get the data from all these different places, make it nice and usable, whether in lake or you know warehouse format, and those are different. But 
Nevertheless, it will put it somewhere that now everybody can come and use it. So that system, just organizational and architecturally, just simply doesn't scale out for where we are today and where we want, where we are heading. You're right. You could you could just look at that uh, from a from an organizational block diagram perspective, very high level, and you ought to be able to smell something. Um, and sure enough, so I want to get back to that. I want to I want to try to give, and we'll see if I remember this. I don't always remember, but I want to try to get back to the the data team and uh, like how do we get them on board? But what happens now? Um, like I've, I've got the picture in my head. I want to make sure I'm, I'm, um, you know, listeners also have the picture. But uh, there was this thing that was designed around daily reporting. Now we need it to be driven uh, to an operational level, which is going to change the kinds of systems we're going to have. And also, we don't want a a, a big funnel of of things that we're going to extract and add value to, and then put somewhere. Uh, we want a web or a mesh of things that are talking to each other. So. That makes all the sense in the world on an abstract basis, but how do you do that? So this is kind of the what is data mesh question. Those are the concerns that motivate it. That's the problem that you're trying to solve, but what do you build? Yeah, and there are hard problems to solve. I'm not pretending that we have actually, you know, technologically have solved all of the problems, but I think we can start with um, kind of high level, how can we make it possible and then go into details of um, practically what what things need to be done. But at the principal level, the things that need to happen is a shift in the culture as well as technology so that the data can be shared for analytical purposes right at the point of origin. We always had this idea that data for it to be used for training machine learning models or you know, right, querying reports has to move mm-hmm to somewhere else for it to be ready for consumption. So first and foremost, I think this idea of the domain ownership, that the domains of the business that are shared now producing data as a byproduct of running their business are responsible for sharing that data in a way that can satisfy those analytical modes of access. And we can talk about what those modes of access are. But once you do that, then how do you prevent the siloing of data within these domains? And the the second principle that Data Mesh introduces is that, well, we need an architectural um, unit or a construct as well as organizational accountability to be able to share this data as a product. So it's no longer that data is just a, you know, bits and bytes on a stream or on a disk is actually packaged in a way that delights the experience of a data analyst or data scientist. It can be found, it can be understood, it can be queried right at the point of origin. And somebody is managing that as a product. They're, this is a thing exactly. that I export to the organization. Exactly. There's no hot potato game that, oh, I just run the you know um, e-commerce system and I'm dumping my events on this beautiful stream that I have. Somebody else would take care of downstream on turning that into, you know, if it's a lake, lake finds, or if it's a warehouse, some bottled water for other people come and drink. No, I'm responsible right at the source to provide, whether it's in an event format, event stream format, or tabular, or file, whatever format it is, I'm accountable for long-term ownership of this data to reflect the reality and the truthfulness of the business with quality and complying with some sort of a global standard so that this product that I produce, this data, is uninteroperable with the others. Right. Right. Okay. And that product thinking is orthogonal to the format of the data. Like you said, it could be tabular, it could be stream. Exactly. Uh, files could be an Excel spreadsheet on a SharePoint share. I, that sounds, it's, I, in fact, let's edit that out. That's terrible. But <laughs> uh, we're not. We're not. <laughs> Narrator, it would not be edited out. <laughs> um, okay. So that, that the product thinking is really the sensibility change that happens yeah. in this, um, what do you call it? This domain encapsulated uh, team. Data, exactly. People building the thing. Absolutely. And then the moment you do that, you go, gosh, that's a lot of work. Like how many data engineers need to go, right? (laughs) How many data engineers I need to go hire so that they can now have, we can have these data products coming out of the domains. And that's, 
I, you know, from kind of the academic point of view, this is wonderful. You have these domains, they're sharing their data, they have data product owners. What could it be? Couldn't it be better than that? But this is the moment that the CIO would say, or the CTO, how do I afford this? How is this going to be feasible? How many hundreds of data engineers do I need to go hire now? And I think this is really gives um, space for innovation here for us to imagine kind of the infrastructure and the technology that enables creating these data products in a way that you don't need to hire hundreds of data product developers. Those are your generalist kind of programmers that that learn how to use, of course, certain tooling, but we have created enough abstraction that they don't need to be specialized data engineers. So that it brings us to kind of the third principle of data, data mesh, which is, you know, reimagining ourselves of infrastructure to use the technologies that exist today, but create, you know, the abstractions that are missing for them to be used much more easily. Right, right. And this clearly creates a demand for those abstract, and that's that, that work is not yet done. Like that stuff needs to emerge now. But just like any, you know, just like any early adopters, um, there's a couple, couple things going on in my mind right now. Number one is like, I spend a lot of my time trying to persuade the people who build things out of bits that event-driven architecture is a good idea. And that's mm -hmm. uh, still a scary proposition because nobody knows how to do it. Nobody has done that. Everybody has the sense that it's a good idea, but everybody's building their first system and it's a scary time, right? So um, I'm, I'm in a sense trying to help mediate this burden that I am also putting on people uh, but let them know it's not that bad of a burden. Same thing here, because I mean, you did just describe again from a product perspective, and like you said, a, a academic or you know, ten thousand foot architectural perspective. It is a glorious vision. Who can deny it? And people who have to build things are like, well, crap. Well, you know, come on. But early adopters now, now are the people who are building that infrastructure. Just like if you built your own Kafka Connect in 2014 or your own Kafka Streams in 2015, like people did that. And it's because they're cool. It's because they were there first, you know, and that's that's fine. But now we've got these standard things, just looking at the Kafka ecosystem that solve those problems. And we are in the early days, we don't know what those APIs yet. We don't know what those, you know, uh, spring mesh extension to the spring framework or whatever they have to be. Um, I think the people who are catching this vision are the ones who are building their own buggy partial implementation of that thing that in five years will be one of two or three competing standards that, that are how you build this. At least that's, exactly. that's what I see. Exactly. I think this is, this is, that's why it's such an exciting time. You know, how many times in a decade we come across you know, this we, we find ourselves at this point that we have this blank canvas to to kind of reimagine and re, you know innovate. So I, I am super excited. And as you said, like over the last few years, because this hypothesis, I suppose, uh, within ThoughtWorks came about. You know, I kind of introduced it in 2018. So we've been kind of busy trying to implement it with our clients, use the technology that exists today. We're not a product company, so we just use the products that are out there and we'll wire them together and we build some bespoke stuff on top. We, I can tell you that there is a lack of kind of new sets of technologies. I would say we still have to capitalize what we have built. It's not like we're going to like throw out all this uh, research and technology that we've built, but we have to guess wire them, program them, configure them slightly differently and fill mm -hmm. some gaps uh, to, to, to build those platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, that's, that's clearly what's coming next. So in, um, I want to get as concrete as possible just for a few minutes in implementations that you've seen and that you've participated in, um, what does it look like? Like, I mean, I, I'll just, I'll just ask some questions that come to my mind. It, like it, uh, to get very tactical about it, this seems like a schema problem on the one hand. Like I need to be, there needs to be some agreed upon way for me to describe the stuff I'm exporting. Or do we, do we not want that to be centralized? Do we, do a, does a, a data team or a product team or a, you know, business unit, whatever that, whatever you call that thing, they're building the application, they're exporting the data. They're taking a product mindset with, with respect to the data. Should there be not, no organizational schema standards, 
and format standards, do they just publish that locally? Like, how does it, how does the integration work? How do you? Yeah, good question. I think, I think, um, let's touch on the fourth kind of aspect we, we didn't talk about, which is related to this, this idea that <clears throat> we need to have some form of a governance, like interoperability, as you said, is a big now concern once you distribute ownership, right? How do, how do we allow these domains to go and define their own data model for their own domain? Because the e-commerce guys understand best how the user is interacting with their applications so they can convey that information either as events or other forms of structure. Nevertheless, the semantic of that user interaction with the e-commerce system semantically they need to co communicate it so we can allow them to go and define the model for that independently but yet in a consistent way with the same language with the same modeling language that if i'm an analyst or data scientist and receiving want to consume data not only about my user interactions with my e-commerce but also um the orders that the customer has put through and also the demographic of that customer that I'm getting from some other third party source. If I want to, you know, correlate all of that data, I don't want to deal with three different semantics and three different syntax languages, right? You don't. Yeah. Exactly. So there are certain concerns that the governance needs to standardize on and the platform needs to enable that standardization. So um, that's why the role of the platform is so key here. And again, self-serve. So in our implementations, in fact, we uh, we created this thing called Data Product Quantum. I'm sorry for the name, but naming it. things is really, really hard. It's hard, and you might as well make it sound cool. So yeah, Data Product Quantum. Yeah, it's like this cool DPQ thing, hmm. you know. <laughs> oh, God, it. it even sounds worse. No, no, so, it's better it's every time um, you say it. So DPQ, anyway, go on. DPQ. Essentially, it's a unit of your architecture that encapsulates the code that needs to maintain a domain data-oriented um, I guess, orient, sorry, uh, domain-oriented data, yeah. So it's the code that maintains that the analytical data, and also it's the access to the data, the under, underlying data itself, over a long retention time, because mm -hmm. analytical use cases need to go back and forth in time. And that unit of architecture, what we have done for our clients, we have automated the scaffolding of that, the blueprint of that, like what constitutes one of these things. And then you get a set of tooling from the platform to define your schema. You know, you can standardize on different different schema standardizations. You have your own JSON base or I don't know, Avro, or whatever the standardization is. Specifically, uh, you know, we're a protobuf or we're a JSON schema. Exactly, or whatever, whatever yeah. you, um, you decide. So, um, so you get those sort of things that need to be consistent, those cross country functional concerns from your platform. And as part of a scaffolding of your data product, you get access to those APIs and tooling from the platform so that, you know, you can have a consistent schema language. You can have a consistent way of um, discoverability of your API. So here I am, you know, user interaction with e-commerce data product. These are the data sets that I expose. These are the SLOs that I guarantee. Oh, okay. You know, all of this kind of information that makes that data really a data product. And here's the code that will maintain this. This is a code that, you know, gets the data from, let's say, an upstream event stream from my e-commerce system, and then it turns it into analytical format. And this code you know, runs on a CI CD pipeline, it's deployed, it has testing, all of those good things. So we encapsulate all of that into a unit of architecture. It looks ugly today. And look and on the surface, you go, oh, I have this beautiful, you know, single unit of architecture. But when you actually look under the hood, it looks it looks very ugly. It's not like microservices that you have a you know Docker file and you have Kubernetes and you deploy this one thing. Um, the logical encapsulation and the physical reality of implementation, there are two things that are very, very different looking. Totally. Uh, to be fair, I think my, my, most microservices looked like garbage in 2014-ish. Yeah. You know, when you were three years into their life, um, oh. you, didn't, you didn't have any kind of container standards and you had them talking to each other through databases and it was, it was a disaster. Yeah. And, and honestly, I mean, most people who, you know, have, are, building services probably would would say they look like garbage now that's that's yeah. that's how we do, that's how we as developers describe our work but yeah. um, it doesn't sound bad I mean I really appreciate how concrete that is uh, and the stuff that sticks to me is 
Um, and I'm going to make it more concrete. I mean, this is a sure. Kafka podcast, so you know, yeah. nobody be surprised. I think ideas like data mesh are not successful if they hitch themselves to a single uh, infrastructure, data infrastructure technology. You need to be agnostic with respect to that. Absolutely. Um, and you kind of need to be a layer above that. But if you're if you're you're doing event driven architecture and you're using Kafka, this would look like well, now there are here is a topic with a well known name, and here is the AVSC file uh, that describes the Avro schema, and it's published in a particular place. And there's probably some other kind of metadata, you know, it's a readme or it's a wiki page or just a little bit of here's here's our guarantees about this. But what I really need to know is um, how do I deserialize this stuff in here and where is it? Um, and I think, I, I want to say, this is totally optimistic, but just putting that down on paper as an organization, like we, th this is, you, you export your, your analytical data this way. Uh, you have to tell us the name of the topic and you have to tell us the schema. Product thinking, a little bit of product thinking, maybe you're bad at it, maybe you're good at it, but it's going to happen. Yeah, that's a that's a that's an API that you've committed to now. Exactly. So that seems like that gets you there. And again, if you're doing something that's that's not Kafka, you, you could say all those same things. Yeah, and in fact, uh, you know, with data mesh, at least where we are today, because there's no universal way of representing data, there's no universal way of querying data. So what we what <laughs> I kind of have um, built so far is that these data products. Uh, they may have, they may choose, especially as they become closer and closer to the source, they kind of source align data products. They will have an, a set of APIs that say, oh, you know, I represent my data as time series events. And here's a cap, here's where you can get to it. Here's the topic address. Here's my schema. Um, and this is, you know, the access control, like you've got to actually, no, no. Uh, right, governance, get authorize governance yourself is a thing. To, yeah. to get access. And here's other information about it. Um, here's my documentation and so on. But at the same time, um, your data scientist <laughs> somewhere down the line may not actually like that representation. So for the same data product, you may need to have a new projection of that data that is semantically, it's the same, it's, it's representative of user interactions with your e-commerce system, but it is storing and providing access based on, I don't know, some sort of a columnar parquet file format and a little bit more batched. Or the folks that are writing reports may not be happy with that either, and they might need some sort of a relational database um, you know, with SQL queries. And I know that we are, our technologies are trying to, like even the, with the Kafka itself, you guys are trying to have like tables and the SQL mm -hmm. queries on top. And because of this multimodal access to the underlying data, right? The need for multimodal access. So data mesh doesn't dictate how do we provide this multimodal access, but it acknowledges that for this to be a tr product, we have to satisfy a spectrum of data users and that a spectrum may like SQL or may like to write Spark jobs or may like to just, you know, subscribe to an event and consume events and do the processing itself. So we've got to meet where the users are today and where their native tool sets are. So you find yourself with a single data product actually having separate ports, separate set of yes. APIs for these different modes of access. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And that comports with the kinds of stories that the, I would say vaguely CQRS -y stories that we tell in the event driven architecture world where, you know, you've got a log, that's your system of record. And of course you can consume that into whatever, uh, cause you might need a relational view. You might need some transformed event view. Uh, you know, you might need some searchable text searchable thing. Um, that's not quite what you're saying, but it, 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 uh, has the same basic shape on the whiteboard, uh, yeah. as, as that. Um, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. There's just a little bit like I've, I've, I love event driven architectures and that's where a lot of inspirations for um, microservices, a lot of inspirations for data mesh came from. That's the world I came from. Um, but we have to be, I guess, cognizant of the, the, really the needs of the analytical needs and the type of queries they run, you know, they run queries over a long period of time, over a mm -hmm. long volume of time. 
So then how, once this data is distributed, how can we still have a system that is optimized for people, as in organizationally doesn't have those synchronization points, but also optimized for systems and computers. So you're not moving data around from so many different places. So there is a, at the technical level, right, even though that we want to satisfy this distribution of data ownership, at the technical level and physical level, we've got to build solutions that does lend itself to some sort of federated query that it's still optimized, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So as this gets productized over the next five years, and maybe there's things going on right now that that I don't know about that that you know make that five years sound like, sound like a long time, but it just kind of feels to me like the sort of thing that that I agree. Five years from now, there'll be some stuff with traction, and it'll still be immature compared to you know the last thirty years of data warehousing, but it'll be it'll be a thing. Uh, I hope so. It'll start answering I mean, right. <laughs> It'll start answering those questions about how do we accomplish federation in a in a way that respects the expense of moving bits around and yeah. uh, the 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 not the long tail but the the head of the kinds of access modes that that systems yeah. and enterprises and I, and I think we are being forced into that direction anyway team I think organizations mm -hmm. are becoming hairy and complex they've got like mm -hmm. three different cloud providers data is like in so many different places and this idea that just keep moving your data around into one centralized place so that you can use it they don't like that they don't they don't they don't want to do that so so I think we are just organically have been pushed to this position that we have to admit that data should be used wherever it is by whomever it's owned. But we need to create that internet-like access for analytical purposes for this large-scale query and training purposes with this distribution embraced wholeheartedly rather than try to fight it you know, we, we, we're right now in a boat that we, the on enterprises on one hand realize that's a reality. I mean, I talk to a lot of kind of CDOs and CTOs and they put RFPs out there to the vendor saying, look, I just want to bring processing to where my data is. Don't tell me put my data into, you know, some sort of a lake and warehouse. Um, but we're trying, we're still kind of fighting. And of course there are some solutions uh, that support that, but we don't, I don't think as an industry we've said, this is, the starting point. If we are building a solution for the next, that's going to serve us for the next 10 years or 20 years, the starting point, the default place to start is that data is ubiquitous. It can be anywhere. We And the, the workloads are analytical workloads. There are large volume, large velocity, streaming or batch, doesn't matter, some, some spectrum of that. And we've got to just, and, and the world is complex um, and, and keeps changing. So then Let's let's embrace that as a reality and start stop kind of fighting it with you know canonical schemas or warehouse or or lake and then I think the solution emerges it, itself uh, in, once we accept the reality. My guest today has been Jamak Terhani. Jamak, thanks so much for being a part of Streaming Audio. Thank you. And there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode. Now, some important details before you go. Streaming Audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer. That's developer.confluent.io, a website dedicated to helping you learn Kafka, Confluent, and everything in the broader event streaming ecosystem. We've got free video courses, a library of event-driven architecture design patterns, executable tutorials covering KSQL DB, Kafka Streams, and core Kafka APIs. There's even an index of episodes of this podcast. So if you take a course on Confluent Developer, you'll have the chance to use Confluent Cloud. When you sign up, use the code PODCAST100 to get an extra $100 of free Confluent Cloud usage. Anyway, as always, I hope this podcast was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, you can always reach out to me at TLBergland on Twitter. That's T-L-B-E-R-G-L-U-N-D. Or you can leave a comment on the YouTube video if you're watching and not just listening, or reach out in our community Slack or forum. Both are linked in the show notes. And while you're at it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and to this podcast wherever fine podcasts are sold. And if you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover us, which we think is a good thing. So thanks for your support, and we'll see you next time.